So then the question becomes, maybe becomes, why monitor, and then if you read the fine print, bugs without backbones in the near shore areas of lakes? Which is a little harder to maybe for, for people to uh, understand. But let me, let me enlighten you. So I've, I've mentioned some of these before, but, but macroinvertebrates are, are very important indicators of lake and stream health because, because they're sensitive. Different species are sensitive to different, di different pollutants, um, water temperature, oxygen, um, different uh, cadmium, any, any, uh, probably any pollutant in the environment, and you, we can find a, a species that, or a group that will respond in some way to, to that stressor. They're also a very important source of food for juvenile and adult, adult fish. So if you don't care about bugs, you might care about fish. And, uh, and, and these are living in the, in the near shore area of, of lakes, that, or I might refer to that as the littoral zone, which is another word for near shore area of lakes. Uh, so the fish are living and feeding in this area, um, often uh, deriving most of their energy from, from that activity. And, and this, this whole area is a really productive area of the lake, and, and up to 40% of whole lake productivity for lakes um, that we study can, be, can, be, uh, can occur in the littoral zone. So the biology of a lake integrates the changes occurring in the watershed, um, and, and the bi by the biology, I'm, I'm speaking directly to the benthic macroinvertebrates in this context. And, and so we get a much more holistic indicator of the, uh, the number of stressors impacting a lake over and above what we study normally in water chemistry um, and things like that. Okay, so I'm, I, a couple of times I've mentioned multiple stressors and, and we're living in Muskoka, you might think, you know, what do we have to worry about? Um, nothing's wrong here. But, uh, but there are a number of things occurring um, that, that uh, can play a role here. We've got uh, development causing uh, increases in phosphorus in some systems. We've got natural declines in phosphorus in others. We've got declines in calcium, um, which are important building, uh, building block of, of invertebrate skeletons. We've got invasive species coming in, and Norm is going to uh, enlighten us a bit on that topic in, in, right after me. Got acid precipitation, climate change, fluctuating water levels, and the list and, and the list goes on. So we're not and here's just one one example of how what lake calcium uh, concentrations have been doing. These are all individual lakes again along time along this axis, and this is the concentration of calcium. Each each of these uh, eight lakes, the concentration is declining, with the exception of this, and we know that's due to um, uh, road. <laughs> Road, uh, what's the word I'm Dust looking for now? Dust suppression. <laughs> Dust suppression, right. Um, which contains calcium in its, in its, uh, in its makeup. And, and so we're seeing um, increases in calcium in Diffie Lake. So this is, these are the 20 lakes and 15 streams we monitor for crayfish and, and benthos. And I'll be focusing on the lakes for the rest of the talk. So um, we uh, sample um, the same lakes for benthos and crayfish. We just do it a little differently. We, we have three sites for, or pardon me, five sites for, for benthos. And uh, we sample each, each site separately, keep those sites separately, um, and uh, <coughs> process them separately. We, we, site, we sample three different sites for crayfish and, uh, and, and set three transects at each site, 54 traps in total, um, and it's a, a, a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> a couple pictures to illustrate that. The, the benthos we sample with just a very simple technique, a D-net, um, shown here. And it's just a kick and sweep technique where you're, uh, you time yourself and, and you're standardized by, by time as, as you walk back to the shore and collect, collect macroinvertebrates in your net. Um, benthos are then processed back in the lab. We, we sieve them and subsample them and, and sort and ID them. We count at least 100, uh, 100 uh, animals from each sample and then we preserve and archive that so we can uh, 
go back. First, the first pass through is just to get really coarse taxonomy, then we go back later and, and get, do a little better. For the crayfish sampling methodology, um, we set modified minnow traps, um, and we bait those minnow traps. This is a picture of a film canister full of cat food, fish flavored cat food. Um, so it's always a lot of a lot of fun being on the lake with us. Um, you can tell where we are. Uh, and then we, you know, very gingerly for some of us, extract the crayfish from the traps and uh, and measure. Well, actually, we identify them, we count, measure, sex them, estimate their maturity, their hardness, their condition, and then use those to calculate catch per unit, <coughs> which is, is just the total number of, of uh, crayfish we capture, that's the catch, and the per unit effort is how many we catch per 54 traps that we set. And these are the, uh, the most common species we encounter um, in this area, and there really are three that we encounter most commonly. Camberus bartoni, um, Orconectes virilis, and Orconectes perpinquis. Um, and it, very easy to tell them apart once, once you've uh, got a few identifying features down. Uh, there are nine species of crayfish in total in, in Ontario. Uh, two of them down here are invasive crayfish species, and we haven't seen them in our area yet, but they are further south. Uh, this one, Rusticus, is, um, is the one I referred to in northern Wisconsin. It occurs actually at the same latitude as we're, we're at here. So, um, and we've noticed it in a couple of southern Ontario lakes. We're hoping um, it doesn't uh, go much farther north. Five minutes. Okay. Right on time. <coughs> so, that's a bit of a preamble on monitoring and benthic macroinvertebrates. Um, the, one, of, one of the objectives of my talk was to give you a bit more insight into what those data can be used for. And, uh, and, and so it's focused on those, on those uh, monitoring um, insights as well. We want to we wanna use these data to detect emerging patterns and the effects of multiple stressors by looking at trends. And we want to predict future threats to diversity and ecosystem function. And, uh, and I'll show you a little bit of, bit of that, and, and that'll be for later. Um, so I didn't want to put any math or graphs or complicated statistics here. So my equations are all really simple. So it's the Durst Environmental Science Center, crayfish data plus time, hopefully equals our ability to detect uh, trends in, in aquatic ecosystems. And these, and these are the trends we see in the crayfish data. Um, so these are, I think, 11 or 12 of the lakes of those 20, actually 19 lakes um, that, we, uh, that we monitor. And as you can see, this is time on, on the x-axis, and we've got you know, 1986 back here, and, and all the way up, I think 2009 is the last data point here. Catch per unit effort, so how many crayfish are in the lake on a given year? Each dot is, is uh, color-coded for an individual lake, and these are all the lakes here. And as you can see, some lakes, we just don't really have any crayfish. They're not very good lakes for crayfish for a number of different reasons. But in every other lake, um, we see um, some degree of decline in crayfish numbers. And, um, and crayfish are, are important. Uh, it, Really, in terms of the transfer of energy in, in aquatic food webs, uh, they're, they're, again, a very important prey item for a uh, number of different fish species. So this is a little, a little disconcerting. And if we look at, if we look at those nine, nine basins that we've uh, <coughs> seen, um, or, or that we've tracked the longest, and that we have a lot of uh, other data for, um, we can see similar declines that a few lakes are just not very good for, for crayfish, but, but the rest are showing steady declines if you fit a line to all those points over, the, over time. And, and this, th this analysis is just showing you, these are all the different water chemistry and temperature variables that we monitor in those lakes. And so this is aluminum, calcium, chlorophyll, DIC, uh, dissolved inorganic carbon, dissolved organic carbon, which I won't explain, but these are, we monitor them because we feel they're important in terms of understanding aquatic ecosystems. So we've got iron, we've got pH, we've got nitrogen and phosphorus, and we've got temperature here. 
And so when you look at the relationship between those variables and crayfish numbers over time, um, these uh, are the number of times that, that these variables occur um, as significant relationships. Or really, they have an ability to predict crayfish numbers over time. And so <laughs> it's a good thing we monitor these because they look like they're important. In, in, uh, and this is the number of times over those nine lakes that they occurred in, in those relationships. So we've got five times this uh, nitrogen and DOC were good, um, had good relationships with, cray with crayfish numbers. But um, the direction of that relationship is what really matters. So even though they're all important in some way, um, the only consistent relationship or um, the most consistent relationship we saw was with calcium. So that calcium decline I, I referred to earlier may be, um, may be one aspect of, of um, the crayfish declines that we're seeing <coughs> across the region. So the second insight I'll share with you um, uh, pertains to the Y monitor uh, prediction um, component, predicting future threats. So my equation here is Dorset uh, macroinvertebrate data. This is a, a caddis fly, one of my favorite macroinvertebrates. Um, divided by, or relative to, um, and this is the Muskoka Watershed Council uh, logo, maybe. Rebecca's shaking her head. <laughs> this is what I intended it to signify. So this is Muskoka Watershed data um, and, and macroinvertebrate data. But the Muskoka Watershed also collects the macroinvertebrate data, and uh, okay. I'll get this straight later. Maybe it's the District of Muskoka that actually, yes, I'm getting a nod. District of Muskoka collects those data and, uh, and all is good. <laughs> and and what we're going to do is hope for a prediction in this context. And so this is the bottom line. This is, this is the plot that, that, this is uh, the plot that would go in the paper. And you, it's going to be hard, hard to see, but what this is, you take all the macroinvertebrate data you have for, and the District of Muskoka has been doing that for, yeah, we have five or six years on each lake, and Dorset has maybe, uh, I included 10 or 15 years in this analysis. And so what you do is take all those data and you put them into one analysis, and what this analysis does is capture the greatest amount of variation in a single plot. So I tell my students that if, if the, the macroinvertebrate that you're looking at is, um, is driving change in the system, then, it'll, it, then it's, it's gonna be associated with lakes, uh, and each of these individual circles are lakes, and the squares are the macroinvertebrates. So these lakes down here are associated with this group of macroinvertebrates, Diptera, Tepulidae. You, you don't have to worry about the names, um, and this group is associated with amphipods, and anything near the middle here doesn't much account for anything in terms of change. So if you look at this, the way you, one of the ways to interpret it is that the Dorset data is in uh, the, uh, the, whatever that color is, um, pinkish, and, and the district data is in the green. You know, on each, you can draw lines across to each axis, and these are the regions that you have to be really worried about. So the lakes in these regions and in these years uh, are so far out of, out of the reference data that, uh, that we should maybe be taking a closer look at what's going on in these. So th these are sort of the one way of identifying systems that, that may be failing. 